Good evening, I'm Deanna and I'm here with Black School Psychologist, Dr. Umar Abdullah Johnson. And Dr. Johnson hails from? Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Okay, and so Dr. Umar, you are a frequent visitor to Chicago. And tell us a little bit about what it is you do and what it is that you're doing when you come to our city. Well, I'm a psychologist and a public speaker and I kind of blend the two professions together in addition to being an educator and a political scientist and I travel the world and the country spreading basically two messages the one for the need for the black community to take control over the development and future of its children and also the need for people of African descent in general mm -hmm. to take control over our future as a people because we're not doing too good I'm a pan-Africanist and I am a follower of the teachings of all the great Pan-Africanists, Martin Delaney, John Brown Russworm, Patrice Lumumba, Kwame Nkrumah, Sekou Toure, and of course His Excellency, the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey, who was the greatest black leader of the 20th century, who gave us the largest black organization of modern history, the Universal Negro Improvement Association. So I'm clearly a red, black, and green RBG brother. That's where I stand. And basically my message is one, to prepare black parents for what's going on with our children in schools. And the other is the message of Pan-Africanism, which basically means that all African people have a responsibility to solve our problems internationally and to solve them ourselves. It makes no sense for our brothers and sisters in England to be fighting the same fight we're fighting in the United States and we not be cooperating on some level. It makes no sense for brothers and sisters in Jamaica Bermuda, the Virgin Islands, to be fighting the same fight that brothers and sisters are fighting in Canada and it not be some degree of collaboration. When you look at all races of people globally, white folk, they are unified on some level internationally to look out for the best interests of the group. You see the same thing with Arabs, East Indians, Native Americans. You see it with everyone except us. So Pan-Africanism is a real simple ideology. It's the oldest ideology that we had. There was Pan-Africanism before there was anything else out that's now being taught. And it basically means that all African people are one people, irrespective of our religion, irrespective of our skin color, irrespective of the languages we speak, irrespective of our cultures, irrespective of our land of birth. We are all of African descent and that we have an obligation to each other and the almighty to put our people back on the throne of where we used to be as opposed to where we are now. And so one thing I want to ask is how do you plan on getting that message uh, out to the black community? What is it about your message that will penetrate the hearts of Africans and African Americans and black people universally um, so that they feel kind of the passion to unify and to make situations better for our people? I think to some extent, as far as my message of education and mental health, I think that's really been penetrating because one of the things that I like to read on my website, I have a conversational tool and I also have a testimonials link where people can actually write testimonials about information they've heard in one of my presentations or interviews and how it affected them. And I regularly get email and voicemails from people who actually took my psychological, or educational, or political advice and put it to use for the betterment of their family and their community and it actually worked. So there is some degree of saturation, but it's not nearly as much as it needs to be because if it were, we would still not be in the predicament that we're in. So obviously, you know, my work is just beginning. Now, I'm probably one of the top three most requested lecturers um, in the United States outside of the mainstream lecturers who we all see on Oprah and Dateline and those types of things. But in terms of uh, brothers and sisters on the grassroots level, you know, I'm top three in terms of most requested lectures. I probably speak about four or five times uh, every week and I do so on a regular basis. When I leave Chicago, I'm next in Cleveland State University this coming Friday. This coming Saturday, I'm in Canada, Toronto, Canada. Sunday, Columbus, Ohio. Uh, Friday the 19th, I'll be in Reading, Pennsylvania. The 20th, Atlanta. The 21st, I go back over to the United Kingdom, London, England, 
for my second national tour. Then I come back. I'm in Los Angeles for the Ebonics Conference. Then I go to Arizona. Then it's back to Atlanta, then to Texas. So I speak quite regularly. So I'm given an opportunity to get that information out. And the fact that I'm requested so much to give the information that I do give, Mm -hmm. uh, I think clearly speaks to the fact that the people see a need avoid somewhere that with my information I'm able to fill. That doesn't mean I'm special or anything like that because there's other brothers who are out there equally putting the information out. For example, I'm in Chicago right now Mm -hmm. at the request of Pastor Ray Higgins Mm -hmm. in the African Village Convocation. I was their keynote speaker last night. So Pastor Higgins, he definitely has a message for brothers and sisters who are leaving traditional religion and looking for a way into the African culture. So he's a highly sought out after uh, informational speaker as well. But again, the fact that I'm asked to speak so much to me means mm-hmm. that obviously there's a void there that I'm being that I'm filling in. Being related to Frederick Douglass, you know, obviously is an extra draw, you know, because mm-hmm. people, you know, like to feel that connection to history. And because I have the same blood in my body that he had in his body and he was the greatest black leader of the 19th of the 18th century. So I think that also that mystique, you know, may feed it to some extent. Mm-hmm. But um I just think people feel my commitment, they feel my sincerity, but at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how good of a speaker you are. Mm-hmm. We've always had great speakers. Absolutely. Marcus Garvey, uh, Frederick Douglass, uh, Henry Highland Garnett, Bishop Henry McNeil Turner, Malcolm King, you've always had great speakers. Mm-hmm. Uh, but at the end of the day, you need to leave a legacy of some sort. Mm-hmm. And because of that, I'm trying to build the Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey Pan-African Academy for Black Boys, an independent, a uh, residential, institution learning academy for black boys i have an architect in new york who's helping me design the building Mm -hmm. and hopefully in 2013 i'll be able to begin my national uh fundraising campaign to actually raise the money to build the school and as far as the location of the fdmg academy that's still wide open it could be anywhere it could be in chicago it can be in detroit it can be in jamaica it can be in africa i'm not landlocked as to where the school is going to be because it's going to be an international (coughs) school Mm -hmm. so the brothers who go there can come from anywhere over the world because it's Mm pan-african so i'm not just helping black children in america i'm a pan-africanist so i'm helping black children wherever they are and so the school is going to be for boys are there any plans to um have girls enter in or an, another school or yes, a different program a separate for girls. school for the girls i'm hoping within three to five years mm-hmm. after the academy for the boys is open and functioning well we'll then open up the anna murray douglas and amy jakes and amy ashwood garvey academy for the girls mm-hmm. anna murray douglas the first wife of frederick douglas the one through whom all of his children were born uh who helped him escape very significant black woman in history and of course Amy Ashwood Garvey, who helped Marcus Garvey co-found the largest black movement of all time. And of course, her successor, his second wife, uh, Amy Jakes Garvey, Mm -hmm. uh, through whom both of his sons were born. Uh, The Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey Jr. and his younger brother, Dr. Julius Garvey, a good friend of mine, who's a surgeon up in, in, in New York State. So with Frederick Douglass doing what he did for the race, and I consider him to be the greatest of the 18th and for of the 19th, excuse me, and for Garvey and what he did for the race, laying the, fa- the groundwork for so many leaders who came after him. Um, I think that it's only right that the school be named in their honor. Okay. And you may not have worked out the details about the criteria for children to attend the school. I right. know a lot of uh, black parents that are in the inner city will not be able to afford Mm -hmm. to send their children to private school or you know pay an exorbitant amount of money uh, in order to send them so what do you plan on doing to make sure that the school is accessible to the students who uh, so desperately need it once the school is built it is my hope that i will achieve enough obtain enough sponsorship Mm -hmm. from ordinary black folk as well as rich and well-off black folk Mm -hmm. to be able to pay the tuition of all the children there. The school will not be based on a capitalistic model. Uh, The purpose of the school isn't for me to get rich or to make money. In fact, if it's possible for me to exist without being paid, then I would vacate my salary altogether. So if I'm able to get enough sponsorship by individuals to sponsor a student to attend or a couple of students to attend, I think that'll take care of the tuition. For example, let's say you, you have someone out there whose children are already of age, and but they want to help contribute to another child getting an education. They might say, okay, I'll sponsor the tuition for two children for five years. That's all I can do. Mm-hmm. I sponsor the tuition of one child for one year. That's all I can do. Mm-hmm. If we get enough of those, 
okay, then the out-of-pocket expense for the parent should be kept very low, if any at all. We'll probably have to use a sliding scale so that your tuition is going to be based on your economic finance. So if you have a child who's from the inner city, mother, single parent, public assistance, then obviously we're going to have to flip their whole bill and find sponsorship for it. But let's say you have a child who comes from middle class parents. They live in the suburbs. They're struggling, but they're doing a little bit better than their tuition. They will have to pay because they can afford it, mm -hmm. but it'll be a little bit more. So we may use a sliding scale, but I would like for it to be totally free. Why? Because if I have a child who loves that school, who needs that school, but mm -hmm. if their parents' economic priorities are not in order and they determine that it is best that the money they're spending to give their child an appropriate education should be spent for a new car or a new house, mm -hmm. they may snatch that young man or lady from the school, okay? And mm -hmm. so then that child is being stripped of something that they really needed because the parents didn't value the education as much as the child did. Mm -hmm. Free education for everybody eliminates that. Now, one thing that I'm not going to do, and I want to be emphatically clear about this, mm -hmm. people say that you should give the, the spots in the school should go to the children who are most in need. I don't agree with that, okay? Every African boy or girl comes to that lottery mm -hmm. with the same opportunity to get accepted, why? Because if I shun the children of bourgeois black parents, if I shun middle class black students, then I'm perpetuating the talent to tip hierarchy in our community that keeps so many snobby Negroes at the top mm -hmm. turning their backs on the ones at the bottom. So I want black boys and girls whose parents are doctors and lawyers and who know nothing about the suburban life so they can be re-acculturated and re-Africanized into that which they should be doing for their people to only give the school to brothers and sisters in the hood and to shun those on the outskirts is to create two different communities, mm -hmm. two different cliques, two different tribes that are gonna war with each other. Mm -hmm. So the best way to eliminate this classism that's dividing us where the educated blacks are against the grassroots blacks, I want the children of both bourgeois parents and poor parents to get an opportunity to learn so we can destroy that whole wall that's up that says if I have a better education to make more money, I'm somehow different and better. I see. And what type of curriculum do you think you will implement at the school in order to prepare the students that are attending for a wider movement when they graduate? The school will be based on 21 pathways, mm -hmm. which means that every young man or young lady who graduates from the FDMG Academy should be able to earn a living in at least 21 different areas or we have failed. So for example, you will learn how to fix cars, mm -hmm. cut hair, build a computer, you see. Okay. And there's a whole list of things that they'll be able to do in order to earn a living for themselves. They will be scholars as well as practitioners. Yes, we want them to be historians, psychologists, educators, engineers, pharmacists, chemists, but we also want them to be electricians, plumbers, masons, heating, cooling, and air conditioning specialists. One of the things we've gotten away from in the black community is the trades programs, mm -hmm. where we're no longer teaching black boys and girls the importance of using your hands. Mm -hmm. So we're sending all of our young people off to college without no trade-based education, mm -hmm. which means if ain't no white people hiring black people, even with a doctorate degree, your family don't eat. So in my school, they're gonna learn how to use their minds and their hands, mm -hmm. 21 different ways in which they can earn a living for themselves. But the six core sciences that will be taught at the academy will be agricultural and agronomical science. If you don't know how to feed yourself, then you don't deserve to be free economic and financial science, the ability to not only acquire resources, but learn how to control them. Mm -hmm. The third one, diet and nutritional science, so we stop dropping dead out of, from all these preventable diseases. The science of black family development and, and maintenance. Astrological and spiritual science, which is so much greater than religion, okay? And political and military science. Mm. Remember, all education must have a goal. Mm -hmm. And the education of an African-centered revolutionary education, the goal is to prepare black children in the art of acquiring, maintaining, and protecting power. That's totally different from the education they get now. Mm -hmm. The purpose of public and charter education in America for black children today is to prepare them to go out and work for white people. 
-hmm. That is it. So whether you have a PhD, MG, PsyD, JD, you are working for white people. Few of us work for ourselves, mm -hmm. okay? The education of the future is an education where we're taught to work for ourselves, not for another person. Excellent. So just, you know, aside from putting in our bid for the school to be in Chicago, <laughs> Once you implement the school, once you get the school up and running, do you plan on making multiple locations across the United States and abroad? If I am blessed to live long enough, I would like to see the school become an international district, a Pan-African district, which means that if a young man in Chicago wants to study in Nigeria, he can go to Nigeria and spend a year or two over there because the curriculum will be universal. So no matter which of the schools you attend, you'll get the same experience. So yes, I want it to be a totally internationalized uh, curriculum and model. So I hope to pepper these schools all across the world because we need them. See, education is the most revolutionary institution you can build. And one of the reasons black people keep finding ourselves in this predicament where we keep on going backwards, where we think we're going forwards, is because we have not re-engineered the psyche of the Negro. You cannot fix our predicament until you fix our thinking. Mm. You cannot fix our community until you fix our psyche. You cannot fix our economic conditioning until you Fix the cognitive model under which we think. Thought precedes action. As the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey said, if you free a man's mind, ultimately you're going to free his body anyway. Education is totally revolutionary because if done correctly, it is impossible to have a slave. Slaves have to be taught to be slaves. And free people have to be taught how to be free. And we got to understand something. There's two types of black people. Mm -hmm. Those who live under freedom and those who were freed. And most of us, we were freed. We are the descendants of people who were once enslaved and then emancipated. Our thinking still has the residue of oppression. Mm -hmm. No matter how free we think we are, we still think like slaves because we have not been out of the peculiar institution long enough to think like free people. We don't live under freedom. We live under freedom. F-R-E-E-D-U-M-B. Freedom. It's very profound. So one other question I want to ask is how you reach the parents of the potential students that are going to be attending your school, even parents now who really don't feel that, you know, that their black children are being miseducated or ostracized or picked on or set apart as learning disability or mentally retarded. Those parents who don't think that there's a problem uh, in the schools, in the public and charter schools. You can't save everyone and we won't be able to reach everyone. But I would say this, I get emails and phone calls every day my voicemail literally fills up once every 24 hours. Parents looking for schools, resources, anything that can help them fight this good fight for their children. So my issue with the FDMG won't really be whether or not I can wake up enough parents. My issue with the Douglas Garvey Academy will be finding enough space to accommodate the children of all the parents who want their young mm -hmm. to be educated at my institution. Mm -hmm. If the school, and we're building the model for 800. Okay. The, the school right now, the architect has 800. That's our number. We're gonna get 8,000 applicants. So the pain that's gonna come from this process for me, the bittersweet pain mm -hmm. is turning away more than I can take in. I see. And so that's when I gotta come back to the black community and say, look, we need more money to build another one. Let's get this thing done. I mean, isn't it ironic that we go to the corner stores, shop and goes, supermarkets, car malls, we go to uh, uh, the shopping centers and we spend billions of dollars. And in spending those billions, we put Asian children through school. Mm -hmm. We put Jewish children through school. We put East Indian children through school. There's Chinese stores in the black community, okay? who have literally been able to finance the education of every one of their children on our diet. Mm. So if we can send other people's children to college, why can't we send our own? 
that's very true absolutely um i was gonna say here recently in chicago there was a teacher strike and one of the issues that the teachers were concerned about was class size how do you feel about class size being an issue in the classroom how are you going to um, make sure that class size isn't an issue in your school quality versus quantity let me first say class size is relevant because the smaller the class the more individual attention an instructor can give the pupil mm -hmm. so obviously if I had a class with two students in it I'm going to be able to maximize education because I only have to make the curriculum digestible to two versus 32 so I do understand where the teachers are coming from, but I want to be clear. The reason why our children are being miseducated has nothing to do with class size. You can cut Chicago public school classes in half and give those teachers 18, give them 10, and the children still will get miseducated because the schools were not designed, nor is the teacher interested in making sure our black boys learn. So class size ain't the issue. On the flip side, you can put me in a school with 50 black boys in a class mm -hmm. and every last one of them are going to learn because I'm committed to their education. The number one correlate to a learned educated the teachers are, it is not class size, it is not how technologically sophisticated the schools are, it is the teacher's belief in that child's ability to learn. I don't take issue with the Chicago public school teachers needing to strike to fight for some of the things that they wanted. But my issue is this. The teacher unions in America are so powerful that they actually stifle a school district's ability to get rid of poor teachers who are no good. That's my problem with the unions. Mm -hmm. Not that they have power. They need to protect their teachers. Mm -hmm. But some teachers are trifling and should have never been given a job. And even when we know who those teachers are, we can't get rid of them. If mm -hmm. a principal in Chicago knows of a teacher who ain't doing a good job, all they can do is write that teacher up. Mm -hmm. And if they complain enough, that teacher will be sent to another school. Mm -hmm. Not fired, but sent to another school. So they're no longer miseducating your child, but they now miseducating my child. My problem with the teachers unions is that their power is excessive and it prevents principals and school districts from getting rid of teachers who should not be in the classroom. Mm -hmm. We're not performing. So what advice would you have, <clears throat> excuse me, for parents whose children are already entangled in the school system, public school systems everywhere? What advice would you give us uh, as parents on how we can sort of teach our children on the back end, kind of? Every parent is a homeschooling parent because you cannot rely on the schools of America, public, private, parochial, or charter to properly provide your child with the information that they need in order to be successful. Mm -hmm. So whether your child is in homeschool or not, you're still a homeschooling parent. Mm -hmm. You must supplement what they're getting. I don't care if your child goes to a private school where you're spending $15,000 a year in tuition, you still have to supplement that education because they're not getting what they need to get in school. Remember now, a lot of teachers, not all, not even most, but a lot, are not teaching. Mm -hmm. They're babysitting. The children are not learning. And the reason why they can't get caught in this process is because there's no quality assurance for education. There's no quality assurance for education. In most jobs, there's a way to evaluate your performance to see whether or not you're benefiting the customer, mm -hmm. not with education, not with education. If you come to school every day and never teach a day in that class, Nothing is likely to happen to you at the end of the school year because there's no quality assurance in place to get rid of teachers who are underperforming. In fact, testing isn't even designed to make teachers accountable. You know what testing is designed to do? Hmm. Testing is designed to blame the student and their parent for their failure. So even with testing, teachers are not held accountable. When the students don't pass the test, they don't look at the teacher, they look at the child and say, what's wrong with you? They look at the mother and the father and say, what's wrong with you? So even testing is accountability for the parents and the pupils, not for the teachers. There is no quality assurance for public education and that's why the schools are failing. Okay, okay. well, is there anything else that you would like to tell our viewers uh, here in Chicago? I would just like to say that it's always a pleasure to come here to Chicago. I'll be back in December 
I'm going to be doing a lecture here in the city. So if folks are interested in coming out for that, they can go to my website, drumarjohnson.com. Any parents with any issues with their children, mm -hmm. special education, ADHD, school suspension, homeschool, expulsion, any issue with their child, they can email me their concern mm -hmm. free of charge and I will respond to them exactly what they need to do to actually facilitate that issue so that the child comes out on top and doesn't end up getting pushed to the side. So they can reach me any consultation whatsoever parents can reach me. Okay. All right, and could you give us that website one more time, please? Dr. Umar Johnson.com, D R U M A R J O H N S O N.com. If they can't remember it, they can simply Google my name and I'm sure it'll come up. Okay. Well, thank you. It was a pleasure speaking with you tonight. It's a pleasure having you in our city. And um, hopefully, we'll be talking to you again. Thank you for joining in. This was Global City Unity. <laughs> And we were here with child psychologist, black child psychologist, Dr. Umar Abdullah Johnson. Thank you for coming. Thank you. The game plan is to wake up my people. The game plan is to wake up my people. The game plan is to wake up my people. Open the eyes with a voice that leads to love, profit, bring the truth. Love, profit, bring your pain. Love, profit, gonna drop it, taking over the game. Connect the dots like a maze. Turn the next page. First place, the profit just blew up the stage. Burned like a brick, slamming in a big glass. Round like a shell in a pump when it blasts. Got you feeling high like your brain on drugs. Pull your pants up, food, tell me what's up. Now you can't focus, get your man off course. Cause y'all is the force and the law is the source. As I can the torch for the dead MCs. Giving mouth to mouth, see for y'all so I can't pop and breathe. Total domination, gotta wake up the nation. Life is real, seven seal, that's the time we facing. Ear to the speaker like a mouth on speech. Only seven years old, so watch this kid teach. The game plan is to wake up my people. The game plan is to wake up my people. The game plan is to wake up my people. Open the eyes with a voice that's lethal. The game plan is to wake up my people. The game plan. Is to wake up my people. The game plan is to wake up my people. Open the eyes with a voice that's legal. Now got me in a rage. I'm about to invade. Open up your Bible. I just jump off the page. Everything happened for a reason. I was taught. Why you catch calls? It was the truth that I caught. We're the chosen ones on the flip side with a curse. Since I saw me go more, now my brothers win a purse. Now you look a shot, got the lie in the headlock. Caught up in this world, you not part of the righteous block. Bring your pain like a toothache. As I terminate, weak MCs disappear and terminate. Ripping up a mic, turning you to my sacrifice. As I slice the dice with a sword from an Israelite. Gotta put the pressure, cause the pressure, but the steel bite. Grabbed in a glad, then I float like a paper kite. Blood dropping, cause the alarms and sound. Game plan is the work of my people in a whole town. Game plan is to wake up my people. The game plan is to wake up my people. The game plan is to wake up my people. Open the eyes with a voice that's lethal. The game plan is to wake up my people. The game plan is to wake up my people. The game plan is to wake up my people. Open the eyes with a voice that's lethal.